Hi, I'd like to talk a little bit about the deaths of stars, and specifically the deaths of the high mass stars. And by high mass, I mean stars that are formed with more than about eight solar masses, eight times the mass of the Sun. These uh, explode as the type 2 supernovae, and they leave behind a neutron star or a black hole. Lower mass stars like the Sun have less than eight times the mass of the Sun. They release a planetary nebula and leave behind a white dwarf. These constitute about 97 or 98 percent of all stars. Two or three percent of stars fall in the group of the high mass stars. And so this is what I'm going to talk about now. So the uh, high mass stars can be seen on the HR diagram along with the low mass stars here. We have a, mat, a star that has less mass than the sun that moves up in, in a red giant branch. Two solar mass star here has a red giant and an asymptotic giant branch. The ones of this topic here are higher than eight solar masses, so they begin way up here as blue main sequence stars and they become blue supergiants, yellow supergiant, and red supergiant, and they can move back and forth here. And these luminous blue variables are among the brightest uh, stars. And um, the, though generally they are not changing their brightness as uh, they evolve off the main sequence because they're moving right and left here, which means their luminosity is staying about the same, the color is changing. So the, they get small and blue and large and red with the overall brightness staying about the same. So high mass stars, as they evolve and become supergiants, expel lots of mass. They have huge stellar winds material is flowing out from the star um, and they can lose substantial fractions of their total mass over time. To give you an idea how big these stars are, if we look at one in particular, Vy Canis Majoris, in the uh, constellation of the Big Dipper, if we look at the Sun, and the Earth's orbit around the Sun on scale with the size of the star, we see that the star is much larger than the, even the Earth's orbit around the Sun. So this is a supergiant star. This is a visual image of it. We can see that it's red and bright. And it's bright because it's big. And um, it's red because the surface is cool. So. This is a red supergiant right near the end of its life. If we zoom in on the core of one of these stars, we can see that it goes through a series of stages of fusion. Originally, hydrogen fusion into helium on the main sequence and going to the red giant branch where hydrogen fusion into helium occurs in a shell surrounding the core, and then helium fusion into carbon, and low mass stars can't go beyond that. High mass stars have enough mass that they can compress the core to sufficiently high temperatures, up to hundreds of millions of degrees, and even beyond, and continue to fuse heavier and heavier elements, producing shells of neon, oxygen, silicon, and then iron. Iron is the element number 26, and it's very important in this process because you cannot fuse iron and get energy out. It takes energy away in order to fuse it. So iron is a very stable element, and once you have it, the star is uh, not able to use it as a fuel and therefore, once it makes the iron core, it's at the end of its life. It can no longer uh, have any energy to shine. 
Once the core then ends the fusion and turns off, uh, it will collapse. And just to look at the time scale and temperature very briefly here, the duration of the hydrogen burning, this is the main sequence, is about 10 million years, which is uh, short compared to the lower mass stars. But the later stages are even shorter. Helium fusion into carbon and oxygen, only about 1 million years. Neon, sodium, uh, magnesium, and aluminum being produced by fusion of carbon, about a thousand years. Neon, producing oxygen and magnesium, only three years to produce that. Oxygen, once made, then can be produced silicon, sulfur, argon, and calcium, and only about a third of a year, about four months. The silicon is then uh, used to produce nickel, which decays into iron, and that iron core is produced over a period of about five days. Suddenly then, the star no longer has any fuel left to burn. So uh, the star will end its life once it builds up that iron core. First of all, what happens is a so-called core bounce. The star collapses in on itself and the core gets to an enormously high density and it compresses the core to extreme amounts. It gets to a point where it can no longer support um, uh, it can no longer be compressed and anything falling onto it will just bounce off and so you get this rebound of material and this rebound of material moves out and it detonates the supernova explosion. Supernova then moves out and explodes blowing the star completely apart except leaving the core behind. So what is the result? In the year 1054, July 5th, for 23 days, a bright object was seen during the day. For um, more than a year, it was seen at night, and it was later discovered and called the Crab Nebula, and we now know it's the supernova remnant. We can see all of the structure. Down here in the center is a neutron star, the object that is the leftover remnant of the supernova explosion. So this is the um, telltale sign that a star did blow up there. And this combination of photographs with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, and different cameras uh, combined sh show that the indeed in the center here there is a waves of material um, and energy flowing out from the supernova. Jets are produced as well in the supernova.